No, but staying with sun-kissed Senegal, the island, uh, the, the country with that boasts island of many seashells. We're looking at uh, the presidential elections that has emerged after weeks of unrest unscathed. And with, from what we're hearing, with an electorate that is relatively happy. So now let's explore the lessons that Nigeria and indeed the African continent can learn from this process. As we have joining us the executive director of Yaga Africa, Mr. Samson Itodo, who joins us from our Abuja studio. Thank you for joining us on the morning brief, Mr. Itodo. Thank you very much. Good morning. Yes, it's good to have you. Now, um, the Looking at the presidential election, um, an opposition didn't just win. In fact, from what we are getting on official results, uh, Mr. Diomaye Faye has a strong lead. You know, so this has uh, surpassed all electoral norms that we know about. Yes, we see you now, Mr. Itudu. Um, what are your thoughts on this process? It's, he's an opposition candidate. What can we learn uh, pretty much from the just concluded electoral process in Kenya? Well, I guess you, you meant Senegal. Um, I, I think that it's a great day. It's for Africa, for West Africa, and for lovers of democracy across the world. Uh, because what we saw in Senegal over the last couple of weeks is a demonstration of people's power and the resilient character of the people of Senegal. Um, who defied all odds, stood up against a dictator, fought with their lives to ensure that constitutional order was restored. But they didn't stop at ensuring the constitutional order and their constitution was respected. But what did they do? They demonstrated by showing up to cast their vote for a leader that they believe has the requisite credentials to bring the country back you know, to the path of progress and democratic development. I think that we should and should continue to celebrate Senegal because it's reclaimed its leadership position as a backstone and a leader of democracy. And so Senegal today uh, has now reclaimed you know, its identity as the poster child of democracy, not just in West Africa, but across um, Africa. There are lots of lessons to learn. And when we think about the outcome of this election, it's important to go back to the pre-election environment and what brought us to this point. Here we are, you know, at a time when that country had never experienced any form of military coup. However, the neighboring Francophone countries were under military rule as a result of unconstitutional changes of government. And so the current president attempted to amend, um, extend his tenure, but the people spoke out. And so when you think about lessons, and I'll come to people's power, but let's look at the, the strength of the institutions that protected democracy and constitutionalism in Senegal. One is the Constitutional Council that Despite Macky Sall's insistence on extending his tenure and changing the dates of elections, the Constitutional Council stood up against the president and said, no, we must respect the Constitution. And the Constitution provides that by 3rd of April, you ought to leave office. And there's no way you can extend your tenure because it runs foul of the Constitution. And so we are learning a lesson about judicial integrity, about judicial independence, that it took the Constitutional Council to call and put the precedent in check. And so for judiciary institutions across Africa, it's a great lesson to learn that you don't need to pander to the whims and caprices of the incumbents. The role of the judiciary is to limit the excesses of the other arms of government and not pander you know, to the, um, the, the, the intimidation, the incursion or the interference, you know, by the executive. The second lesson to learn from, you know, Senegal is a strong leadership lesson for the leaders on the continent. Now, you cannot take 
the people for granted when they vest their trust in you. Because what Macky Sall did was to take the people of Senegal for granted and wanted to perpetuate himself in office. And so you need to, our leaders need to learn that when your term has come to an end, please leave because you're not the only leader who can solve the problems that people grapple with. And so staying and extending your term in office beyond the moral question is the fact that it undermines the same constitution. Because as a president, you are a creation of the constitution. You cannot, you cannot, you know, use your powers to undermine the same constitution that created you. So this Mugabeism that we often see, you know, in, in, in public leadership, where political leaders don't want to leave office, and this is a big lesson um, for them, but also a, le a legacy, a legacy lesson. All right. Macky Sall, prior to this um, misdemeanor, was touted, you know, as a strong democratic leader. He, he led, you know, Senegal through several reforms that were celebrated, you know, across the world. Is it cutting down the cost of governance, um, and reverting to unicameral legislature? You know, he had all the rhetoric, you know, of a credible democratic leader. But now his term and his tenure is going to end with this, you know, a, attempt, an unsuccessful attempt to extend his tenure in office. So when you think about Marquis Hall's legacy, everything we are going to refer to is his attempt to subvert the constitution yeah. of Senegal. And so for leaders who are, in, who are currently in office, don't think you are above the law. You cannot be above the law in a constitutional democracy. And so learn lessons, you know, from um, Macky Sall's ignoble um, end. The third lesson is about people's power. And one of the things we celebrate about Senegal is the resilience of the people of Senegal. They said enough is enough. Some of them lost their life due to repression from security agencies. But today we jubilate because the people of Senegal have demonstrated that they are sovereign and, they are, and their power, their power was demonstrated prior to this election. We're talking about this election today because people went to the streets to protest. Because religious leaders stood with the people to call out the excesses of the executive. And so we need to learn that we cannot give up even when things have gone south. We cannot give up when the state uses its instrumentality of force to clamp down on citizens. We cannot lo lose faith and lose hope when security agencies are clamping down on the rights of people. That democracy is about engagement, is about asking right. questions, is about exercising your power, um, whether on the streets or in boardrooms or in meeting rooms, that the people of Senegal have taught us as a people that we have power in a democracy. We just need to use that power and use it consistently. All right, Mr. Atoto, uh, we're going to find out whether um, the ballot paper has had the faces of the candidate. You're going to respond to that uh, because we're seeing uh, some pictures of that election. But whilst you're trying to prepare for that answer, uh, you mentioned the fact that this, this very sad co commentary of African leaders being notorious for starting as heroes and ending up as villains, Robert Mugabe, uh, we can go, the list goes on. Some are still alive. Uh, some are on the exit corridor, but they refuse to leave power. And Macky Sall almost did that for himself and all of that. So what played out in Senegal? Is it the people punishing Macky Sall and his, uh, whatever he stands for, or bar, oh, not bar now, Fai had a better proposition for the people? What really played out? What really played out? I think what happened in Senegal was the people seeking for alternatives, was the people seeking for improvement in their social conditions. They had lost trust and faith in Macky Sall because the country is experiencing economic depression. Um, you can see the level of unemployment is on a high increase. You have a situation where over 40% of the population, you know, are grappling with economic inequality. And so for them, they were looking for an alternative. And they saw an alternative in in Sonko and, and, and Fai. And so they thought that the best way to do this is to remove 
a non-performing party through the ballot and not through arms and not through violence. And I think it's one of the biggest lessons that change can come through the ballot, that the most sustainable change, political or social change, is through active citizenship, is through effective and consistent organizing, that taking to violence and arms will not in any way solve or address the problems, the leadership problems that we face. And the day as the people of Senegal, you know, send a strong message to the political class of Senegal, absolutely yes. Through this election and prior to the election, the people sent a message that if democracy is government of the people, by the people and for the people, then the people have the power to determine the course of their destiny. And what they did was to rise to the occasion, instrumentalize their power to get the change that they want and the change that they deserve. But I also hope that knowing the people of Senegal, they are not going to sit back because they've elected fire into office. They're going to have to hold him to account for the project which was touted as his own economic and political agenda to, to restructure Senegal and bring Senegal back to the path of economic progress, but also, you know, his agenda of Pan-Africanism. And I think that, give it to Fai, he's got the work cut out for him. However, it's going to take the consistent vigilance of the people to keep him in check and ensures that he fulfills the promise that he has made to the people. Because knowing the people of Senegal, if he fails to deliver, they are also going to give him the same treatment that they have just given Macky Sall and Amadou Ba. You know, it's just phenomenal to see the, uh, you know, the months leading up to this election from going to prison, coming out barely days ago, now uh, almost president-elect. Looks like going to prison is part of the prerequisites <laughs> <laughs> <of the, laughs> <laughs> now. I've seen that with Olusha Gombasajo and the rest. But uh, speak to the process, and I think Jeffrey was making reference to uh, what the ballot looked like. We saw images of the candidates on the ballots, tiny ballots like that. So uh, maybe that also helped in this whole process. Is another case entirely. If that is something we'll be taking on, is another question entirely. But they will always say the population is different, the funding is different. But I'd like you to speak to that. Is that also responsible for perhaps the outcome we've seen? How it is easier to identify the candidates and cast your ballot? Cast your ballot. Well, Kayode, you can't rule that out. And you, and you know that uh, for us at the Aiga Africa, we've um, been speaking about the need um, um, to review our ballot papers and to have the images of candidates and the logos of political parties. When we went to Liberia for elections, that's also one of the lessons. So if you look across Africa, um, there are electoral commissions that adopt this format for ballot papers where the images of the candidates and their logo of their political parties is on the ballot paper. Because what it does, it improves the quality of choices that people make. So if you look at things like invalid um, ballots, it will be reduced you know, to, to a drast drastically um, if you adopt this format. I, I don't think that we, 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 we should adopt you know, the structure um, where each candidate has its own um, ballot papers. Um, Senegal has got, it, its population cannot be compared to Nigeria. So Senegal can afford, you know, to print this number of ballot papers for um, the 7 million um, people who are registered. But Nigeria has 93 uh, million registered voters. And in cases where you have 18 political parties, um, it means if you have, um, in, in a particular ward, if you have 2,000 um, 2, um, registered voters, it then means you have to print, you know, um, over actually more than 2,000 ballot papers because each candidate has his own ballot papers. Yes, it improves the quality, it reduces invalid vote. Um, however, for a context like Nigeria, you cannot adopt that um, strategy. However, you, but you can you can't change the format of our ballot papers. And we've advocated for this and still advocating for this, that for Nigeria's ballot paper, we can review the format, have the logo of the party, but also the image of the candidate. 
in some countries, they have both the image of the substantive candidate and their running mates on the ballot um, papers. But, uh, but I think if you look at the cost for Nigeria, given our population, given the logistics um, implications for adopting that kind of approach, it is best for Nigeria to adopt a ballot paper that has the logos of the political parties and the candidates of the political um, uh, parties. That way, it will reduce invalid votes. It would also improve the quality of voting choices that people make at the polling unit. I need to sneak this in. I know a lot of people are celebrating this as a win for not too young to rule, even though some people say, well, 44 is not exactly a youth anymore. The jury is out there. But speak to us about this. Is youthful or does being youthful necessarily mean you are useful to governance or you would perform better than the others we have seen? Is that a valid argument? Is that a valid argument? No, I think it's a victory. It's a victory for young Africans. Uh, young Africans, those in Senegal, you know, came out to cast their votes for a young person who they believe understands their language. Age is not a guarantee for performance. But I tell you, at a con as, uh, in a continent where the average or the median age is 19, and you have a large chunk of our population dominated by young people, but politically are a minority, it's such a misnomer. You cannot have subterranearians who should be resting and playing with their grandkids, you know, struggling um, um, to, to govern or rule um, the people as the case may be. I think um, FIRE comes with a lot of energy. Given the kind of challenges that our nations face, you need leaders who are energetic, who have fresh ideas. You need leaders who are innovative, you know, in public office. And I have confidence that FIRE has what it takes to rule that nation, not because he's young, but because he comes with a fresh perspective, and that's what our society needs now, is fresh perspective and not a political system that is dominated you know, by old and expired politicians who should be retired um, but have continually recycled themselves in office. And I think that other countries should learn from what the Senegal youth have done, that they have made a bold statement that they believe in youth leadership and they are not going to rest because he is young, but they are also going to hold him to account. So Nigeria and other countries should learn, trust young people with leaders, with leadership role. In Nigeria, yeah, in the legislature, we're seeing more young people, but we need to go beyond that um, as we march towards subsequent elections. Indeed, Mr. Chodo, the coming days in Senegal will be quite telling. And uh, as we look at, uh, you know, uh, Diomaye Fai. Uh, in his methodical approach to things, let's hope that all of this grandeur will produce results when he takes office. So, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on the program. Mr. Samson Itodo is Executive Director, Yaga Africa. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And now, up next on the program is the softer side of things where we'll look at the nominations in that all important list from the AMVCA. So, stay with us. We'll be right back.